I mean, this is so much simpler than it was <laughs> in the old old days. Cisco have lent me two firewalls, a 1010 firewall as well as a 4215 firewall. Massive firewall this. Here's a small firewall for a small medium business. I've also purchased this 1010 firewall, so I've got two of them one that I own and one that Cisco have lent to me. Cisco helping me create a series of videos about their firewall products, but these are not sponsored videos. In other words, they are lending me the product, but they're not paying me to create these videos. They'll just help me with a technical review of the contents to make sure that it's accurate. Now, the information that I'm covering in this video will help you if you're preparing for the CCMP or CCIE security exams. will also help you with your understanding if you're studying for the CCNA, not that you need to know this technical detail for the CCNA, It'll also help you if you're just trying to evaluate firewalls and get an understanding of how Cisco firewalls work, as well as other Cisco security products. I'm hoping to create a series of videos covering a whole range of Cisco security products. Let me know in the comments the kind of content that you want to see on the channel. Now, I'm going to cover a whole bunch of stuff in this video. Use the timestamps below to jump to specific portions of the video that you're most interested in. Otherwise, continue watching and I'll cover an overview of the devices, different management options, show you the different interfaces, show you how to initially get this configured and up and running, show you how to license the device. Now, a big piece of advice and a warning when setting up a Cisco 1010 secure firewall. When you initially set this up, it's going to take 30 to 40 minutes to boot. Don't expect to be able to plug it in and it just works. This only applies when you initially get the device. So if you've got a brand new firewall or you reset it to factory defaults, simply plug in your laptop and wait Till you get an IP address before you do anything else. Big warning, wait at least 30 to 40 minutes before you even attempt to try and configure the firewall. Once the initial configuration is done, the boot process is normal, very, very quick. But initially, you have to wait 30 to 40 minutes before you can set it up. So go and get a coffee, plug it in, go and do something else, wait that amount of time. My advice is plug in your laptop or your device and wait till you get an IP address in the range 192.168.95 something. So in my example, the IP address that I've been allocated through DHCP is 192.168.95.6. Don't try and do things like I did in the past by trying to plug into the management port or into other ports, trying to do things to configure the firewall. Simply plug in your laptop into a port 2 to 8 and wait till you get an IP address. So the first ethernet port is where you connect to your internet connection. It's recommended that you plug it in, but it's not required. And then you plug in your PC into one of the ports two to eight. And again, you need to wait till you get an IP address before you can do anything else. Other ports on the firewall include a management port as well as a traditional console port and mini USB console port. You can also lock the firewall. So if it's in a retail environment or another environment, it doesn't walk off. So you can lock it down. There's also a reset button if you want to reset the firewall. It also has a USB port if you want to copy the operating system, as an example, from a USB drive to the firewall. Obviously, it has a power port and has LED status indicators. So in this example, notice they're all green. Again, just wait the 30 minutes to 40 minutes. Make sure that it boots up, that everything is green, and that you've been allocated an IP address through DHCP. In this example, I've got my PC connected to port 3 using this blue cable. The internet is connected on port one. Apart from that, I've done nothing else to the firewall except power it up, plug in those devices and wait till I get an IP address. Now I'll put some links below to some documentation that can really help you. One of those is the getting started guide. Really important to read the documentation, even though I know a lot of us don't. But as you can see here, ethernet one one is connected to a modem or router. So in my example, the red cable, you'd plug in your management computer into port two, or three to eight. So one of those ports, again, in my example, it's in port three. If various devices can be connected to those ports. Ports seven and eight provide PoE, in this case, PoE plus. So you could connect an IP phone as an example to one of those ports and receive power. And as mentioned, you've got a management port, you've got a console port, a mini USB port, USB for copying operating systems to the device. Now, there are different ways to manage a firewall such as this. You could use the Secure Firewall Management Center or FMC, previously known as Firepower Management Center. This allows you to manage multiple devices. We're not going to cover that in this video. You could also use CDO or the Cisco Defense Orchestrator, which is a cloud-delivered firewall management center. Again, I won't cover that in this video. I'll cover that in separate videos. What we're going to cover in this video is how to configure a single firewall using the Secure Firewall Device Manager, also known as FDM. So this is the Simplified On-Device Manager. Now, we can't forget about using automation to configure these devices. 
Cisco have the Secure Firewall Threat Defense REST API, as well as the Secure Firewall Management Center REST API. I'll cover those if you're interested, but I think the most important ones are FDM, CDO, and FMC. Okay, that's enough talking. Let me show you how to configure the device. I have once again plugged in my PC into port three here using the blue cable. The IP address that I've been allocated through DHCP is 192.168.95.6. So I'm gonna simply browse to 192.168.95.1. Now, just something else to be aware of. If you've got an older version of the firewall operating system, you'll be allocated an IP address in the range 192.168.1.0. Slash 24, but because I'm using a newer release of the operating system, IP address is 192.168.95.0 slash 24. So HTTPS 192.168.95.1. Now this is using a self-signed certificate. So you've got to accept uh, the certificate and can proceed to the device. And as you can see here, Cisco Secure Firewall Device Manager is shown a default username is admin and default password is admin 123 with uppercase A. Again, that kind of information is available in the documentation. So we need to log in with the admin username and password admin 123 and click login. Okay, you have to accept the end user license agreement. So I'm going to click accept. Now we have to change our password. Please note that password recovery is not possible. So make sure you remember the password that you set. So default password once again is admin123 like that. And I will put in a super secure password. Notice the requirements. So your password has to be a good password. They do give the option to copy the password to clipboard. And I'm going to click change to change the password. Okay, I'm using Brave here with colors inverted to make sure that everything is in dark mode, but this is not showing so nicely. So what I'll do is jump to Chrome so that we can see the colors clearly and notice this is what it looks like. Okay, we can see in the device setup wizard, we now asked to configure the internet connection. Now we can skip that if you want to configure the device manually, but be aware that you cannot restart the device setup wizard if you do that. So if you're starting out and you want to use the wizard, have this internet connection plugged in so that you can complete this wizard. So notice here, we are told that port 1.1 is connected to our ISP. So we have a connection to a DNS server. And if we scroll down, we can see that our outside interface, Ethernet 1 slash 1, is using DHCP for IP version 4 and DHCP for IP version 6. We could change that and manually configure the IP address for both of those protocols, but I'll just leave it at the default using DHCP. As you can see here, the firewall is connected with basic policies. So rule one is trust outbound traffic. Default action is to block all other traffic. So a very safe way to configure a firewall initially we can get to the internet, so we can go from the inside interface to the outside interface, but sessions from the internet can't be initiated to our internal network. But obviously, replies can be returned. This is required for smart licensing. We also told here that the device has connectivity to the Cisco cloud. Don't use the startup wizard if you want to use low-touch provisioning with Cisco Defense Orchestrator or CDO or the Secure Firewall Management Center. We've shown the serial number for the device and we've got an easy deployment guide that we can use if we want to configure uh, the device. But we're not going to do that. We're going to configure the device locally. Now, don't let this confuse you. Inside network is in VLAN 1. The outside interface is not in VLAN 1, even though it's shown as green here. The green that they trying to indicate here means that the interface is up and working. So two green interfaces showed me that those two are connected. Orange means that those interfaces are not connected. The fact that those two interfaces are green does not mean that they're in the same VLAN. This is outside and the other interfaces are inside. That just indicates the state of the interfaces. So the internal devices on VLAN 1, this is a separate routed interface on the firewall. Okay, so enough explanation, let's click next. As you can see, the firewall is connecting to the ISP WAN gateway. Now notice this, changes are being saved. It can take around two minutes. So the initial configuration does take time. Remember 30 minutes to 40 minutes to get it started. You have to do this initial configuration, it takes a bit of time. But once this is done, a boot up is quick. Okay, now we're told that changes are being deployed. This can take a few minutes. So again, you just need to be patient during the initial setup of the device. 
Okay, notice the difference now. Interface Ethernet 1 slash 1 is confirmed, notice the green here, is confirmed to be connected to an ISP WAN gateway. So we have connectivity to a DNS server. Now what we need to do is set up an NTP server for time. So simply specify your time zone. So my time zone is UTC plus one, Europe, London. Default NTP servers can be used or you can configure your own. I'll just use the default NTP servers and click next. So the firewall tells us that changes are being saved. Third step now is to configure smart licensing. And the great thing here is that you can use a 90 day free evaluation. It's recommended that you use this if the device is cloud managed. And we're told that we need to make sure that we register the device with Cisco before the evaluation period ends. But this is great from a lab point of view. So, or testing point of view, you can test all the features for 90 days to make sure that you understand how the device works. Use this to prepare for exams and so forth before you actually register the device properly. So I'll start with that and then I'll register the device later. So I'm gonna click finish. Registration changes are now being saved. And there you go, the device is up and ready to be configured. We need to decide if the device will be cloud configured or a standalone device. So once again, we're going to configure this as a standalone device. We need to configure the interfaces uh, we can see the status of the interfaces. So one slash one and one slash three are up as well as the management interface. We can see that ethernet interfaces one slash two to one slash eight are switched interfaces. So we can see all configured as switch ports. We also have a management interface, which is a routed interface. At the moment, no bridge groups are configured. No ether channels are configured. We've got one VLAN, which is VLAN one. It's the inside interface. It's a routed interface with this IP address, 192.168.95.1. Remember, these interfaces are all part of that VLAN, VLAN 1. So this is the SVI or switched virtual interface, if you like, or routed interface for VLAN 1. Now clicking on device firepower, we can once again see an overview of the device and the network setup. And we told again that we need to set up smart licensing, which I'll do once again in a moment. But let's have a look at some of the options here. We've got our various interfaces, which I've looked at already. We can look at the routing configured. So if I look at the configuration of the firewall, we could configure a static route. We could configure BGP, OSPF, EIGRP, and we could also configure ECMP traffic zones if we wanted to. But this has got a default gateway to the internet, so I'm happy with its configuration. Let's have a look at the updates which includes geolocation. Now we can configure updates for geolocation information, which basically allow you to define countries and continents that you may want to permit traffic from or block traffic from. So I could update this from the cloud as an example. Cisco highly recommends that you keep the geolocation database updated. We can also keep the VDB database updated, which is the vulnerability database. And as we told in the documentation, this is a database of known vulnerabilities to which hosts may be susceptible, as well as fingerprints for operating systems, clients, and applications. The firewall will use the vulnerability database to help determine whether a particular host increases your risk of compromise. So we could update that. And then we asked, do we want to automatically deploy this after the update completes? But be careful, that may result in traffic loss for a short amount of time. So I'll say yes to that. So notice that's scheduled to update. Now, if we look at task list, we can see what's happening in the background. We can see the geolocation information has been updated and currently the VDB database is being updated. Now you can get security intelligence feeds from Telos rather than trying to update this yourself. You can update stuff like this yourself, but much easier to get a recurring feed. Now you're gonna to wanna to configure those updates. So I'm gonna configure this to update daily at let's say, at let's say 3 a.m. in the morning and click save. Okay, so I've configured geolocation. Now I need to configure the VDB database. So again, I'll just set this up to update at 4 a.m. and automatically deploy the update and click save. And the intelligence feeds, I'll get that to update hourly and click save. Now, the great thing here is remember, I'm just using a evaluation license and I'm able to configure all of these options and see how it actually works. Okay, so let's look at intrusion rules. Let's do a configuration of this. And again, I'll just set this to update, let's say at 5 a.m. every day. And I'll click automatically deploy the update and click save. Now we told you that the Snort engine can be upgraded. So if I click on that option, I could say, okay, let's update this. But notice this requires an automatic deployment to complete the process. If I click yes here, notice we need to deploy the other options before I update this. So we'll need to 
get those changes deployed first and then I'll be able to update Snort. Now the current version of software that I'm running here is 7.25. I'll show you in a separate video how to update the system because it can be upgraded to a later release. Notice at the top here, we told that objects are ready to be deployed and notice the VDB version is gonna be updated from 2023 to 2024.09.14. So I'm gonna click OK. As you can see now, the deployment is in progress. This could take a few minutes to complete. So we can see what was previously deployed by clicking on the deployment history. So as an example, here we can see that at 10 past eight, device setup automatic deployment final step was deployed. So I'll click back on device firepower. One of the important things we need to do is set up the smart license and we're going to need to register the device. We've still got 90 days left on this evaluation period. So I've got a lot of time to register the device. But while I'm here, I can enable threat license. I can enable malware. I can enable the URL license. Base license is already included, but those can be enabled now for 90 days because I'm using the evaluation license. Now I can register the device with smart licensing. So we told that we need to create or log in to your Cisco smart software manager account. So I'll click on that link and there you go. So I've logged in now, you can see my virtual account is demo. I can create new tokens and that's what I'm told to do next. So on your assigned virtual account, under the general tab, click on new token to create a token. So I'll do that, click proceed. So I'll call this demo 1010 firewall. Expire after 30 days, I only need one user account. So I'm gonna specify one here and I'm gonna click create token. I'm told that a new token has been created. So we then told to copy the token and paste it in here. So I'll copy that, paste it in here. And the region that I'm in is EU. So I'll specify that. And I'm going to enroll in the Cisco Success Network and click register device. So while that's waiting, notice if I go to licenses, I can see that no licenses are currently in use. But once that updates, I should see that my in-use licenses have changed and so is the balance of licenses available. So we say registration request sent on 19 September 2024. Normally takes about a minute to complete the registration. Notice under device firepower, under smart license, we can see that the device is now registered. So under configuration, we can see our smart license. Last sync 19th of September 2024. Next sync tomorrow. So our licenses have been enabled now on the Cisco website. Under licenses, we can see that the firepower threat defense base features, one license is in use. The same for the malware protection, same for threat defense protection and URL filtering. So those licenses have been enabled and I have no licenses available now. I'll enable the RA VPN license. And as you can see, that's now enabled as well. So the next thing we wanna do is go to security policies and set our policies. So I'll select policies. Various options can be configured here. As an example, let's look at security intelligence. This basically allows us to drop unwanted traffic based on source destination, IP address, or destination URL. This information is supplied by Cisco Talos. And the idea here is rather than statically creating permit or deny statements and having to constantly update those, we are getting a feed from Talos based on the latest security information. You can augment this list of IP addresses and URLs with your own items. Now to use this, we need to enable the threat license, which you've already done. So that means we can enable security intelligence. And as you can see now, that's been ticked. The whole idea here, once again, is we're gonna block bad domains, bad IP addresses based on the latest information from Cisco Talos. So to do that, we're gonna click on the plus here to block or drop specific traffic. And then we can enable specific network feeds. So attackers is active hacking hosts. So I'll select that. What about banking fraud? So sites that engage in fraudulent activities that relate to electronic banking, bogan addresses, or addresses that are known to not be allocated but are sending traffic. And I mean, as you can see here, there's a whole bunch of these. We've got crypto mining, exploit kits, high risk websites is domains and host names that match against open DNS predictive security algorithms from a security graph. We've got high risk, IOC, link sharing, malicious. Let's look at malware. I think that's kind of obvious. These are hosts that are attempting to propagate malware or actively attacking anyone who visits them. And we could just select all of these. Phishing would be a good one as an example. 
So which websites or hosts are attempting to trick users into entering confidential information such as usernames and passwords? We've got spam, we've got spyware, suspicious. We even have Tor exit nodes, and then we can click OK to add all of those to the block list. So the advantage here, once again, is rather than us having to manually try and update this stuff, we just get a feed from Cisco Talos that automatically updates this. As an example, websites that are malicious are changing all the time. Malware websites are changing all the time. Rather than us as administrators trying to manage this, we just get the feed from Talos and update our firewall accordingly. The advantage here is if any traffic matches one of these, the session is dropped the traffic is not permitted. Okay, let's look at NAT. Very basic setting here. All IP version 4 traffic going to any destination is going to be NATed to the outside interface. We could edit to this and change our NAT rules if we want to. So the title here is Inside Outside NAT Rule. It's enabled at the moment. All traffic from the inside interface going to the outside interface, that's IP version 4, is going to be NATed. But we could decide to change this if we wanted to. So we could, as an example, only select specific RSC 1918 addresses. That's okay, so I'm going to click OK here. Next option to look at is access control. There's a default rule once again that says all traffic from the inside is permitted to the outside. So basically, we can go to any website that we want to, but we may want to change that and block specific websites as an example. Notice we have the option here showing a diagram which shows us that all users, all networks, geolocations, ports, from the inside are gonna be permitted going anywhere on the outside. But what we could do is create another a rule. So select the inside zone. Now the change that we're gonna make here is rather than trusting all traffic, we're going to allow it, but we're gonna run an intrusion policy. So I'm gonna enable that. And notice we can use this as a last line of defense against unwanted traffic that you are otherwise allowing. So this allows us to examine decoded packets for intrusions, exploits, and other attacks based on patterns and can block or alter malicious traffic. Again, we're using Cisco Talos here. So what we could choose here is balance security and connectivity. We can select different options like maximum detection, security over connectivity, but I'm gonna select the balanced security and connectivity option. And under the file policy, I'm gonna select block malware. The whole idea here once again is the firewall is gonna scan our files and make sure that there's no malware hiding in the files. Now, at the moment, we are basically allowing traffic from the inside to the outside, but let's say you want to block specific websites such as Facebook or other social media websites. What we can do is click plus to create a new policy. So let's block social media websites. And rather than allowing that, we're going to block these websites. We're going to select anything on the local area network or inside network or inside zone going to the outside zone or outside interface. We have different options here. We could select specific applications. We could look at URLs, users, intrusion policy, file policy, and so forth. What I'm going to do here is select URLs. And the category that I'm going to select is, as an example, social networking. And then I'm going to click OK. That's based on the Cisco Telus information. Once again, any website that Cisco Telus deems to be social media, so X, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, etc., will be blocked. Now, before I click OK, Let's test this. So I'm going to go to facebook.com. As you can see, that works. I'll go to x.com. And you can see that works. Let's shut those tabs down and click OK. Now, at the moment, this policy is in the second place here. We are permitting everything and then we're blocking social media websites. So what we want to do is move this up so that we're blocking social media first and then permitting everything else based on our rules and policies. So notice now this is still not going to work because I haven't deployed the changes. So what I need to do here is select a deployment. We can see deployed version, pending version. So we're permitting balanced security and connectivity. We've got a blacklist for blocking, a bunch of options here. And then we are blocking social media websites. So I'll click deploy now. And as we can see, the deployment is now in progress. So I'll click OK. Now, this will typically take a few minutes to deploy. Once the orange dot at the top here disappears, that means that the policy has been deployed. 
and we can test it. Now, just a note under intrusion, you can see what these actually mean. So we've got balanced security and connectivity, connectivity over security, maximum detection and security over connectivity. So just as an aside, you can get an explanation of what this means. Basically, it's based on Cisco Telos policies. So this one attempts to strike the delicate balance between network connectivity and throughput and the needs for security. As you can see now, the orange dot has disappeared. Our policies have been deployed. So let's test if we can get to Facebook. As you can see there, nothing is happening at the moment. I'll try and go to x.com. That's also not working. I'll try and go to instagram.com. Also not working. What about YouTube? I can get to YouTube, but I can't get to these social media websites. What about tiktok.com? also being blocked. Now, what's nice is under access control, when I look at these policies and the URLs, I can check whether they'll be blocked or not. And as you can see, web reputation is trusted. What about tiktok.com? Notice we can see web reputation is favorable, but if we scroll down here, content category is social networking, which is different to YouTube, which is seen as streaming video. So I could, as an example, add a category here, and block streaming video and click OK and deploy that now. And that should block YouTube in addition to the other websites. So at the moment, Facebook is blocked, X is blocked, Instagram is blocked, TikTok is blocked. I can get to YouTube, but once this is deployed, I won't be able to any longer. Okay, so that's now being deployed. Let's try that again. So previously I was able to get to YouTube. Now it's hanging. I'll copy this to another tab it's hanging once again. So I'm not able to get to YouTube. So that policy is now working. Now notice we do get a warning here, access policy settings. We recommend that you enable TLS server identity discovery to ensure encrypted connections are matched to the right access control rule. So if I click on the cog, I can enable that and click okay. What I really like about the firewall is this is a lot easier than in the old days when I used to configure Cisco PIXs or Cisco ASAs through the CLI. Much harder to do it in those days than doing it this way. I mean, this is so much simpler than it was <laughs> in the old, old days. Now, if I click on monitoring, I can see monitoring information about the firewall. Notice I can see which interfaces are connected once again. So we can see outside interface, inside interface. We can see the management interface is enabled. You might want to disable that. We can see CPU usage, memory usage, disk usage, etc. But let's configure some more options. So let's click on objects. Notice various network objects and groups are created here, such as any IPv6, any IPv4, private addresses, etc. We are currently using any IPv4 addresses to permit traffic, but let's deny traffic to specific geolocations. So under geolocations, let's create a geolocation. Notice we can specify different parts of the world. So let's assume that I've got no business in Africa. I could select the whole of Africa and block that if I wanted to. So let's call this Africa, block traffic to Africa, and I'll click Africa and click OK. Now, this is a really bad example for me because I do have a team that works in South Africa. But notice if I go to News24, which is a new site in South Africa, that works. So I can get to that website without any problems. This is a really popular news site in South Africa. But let's click OK to block the whole of Africa. Now, obviously you might only wanna block specific countries, but this gives us a nice demonstration of that. So I'm going to deploy this policy to block all traffic to Africa and click deploy now. Okay, so that's been deployed now. Let's refresh the website to News24 and notice I can still get there. I can also get to other websites in South Africa. So The Citizen is another newspaper in South Africa. So that's not actually working yet. So what I need to do, is go to policies. At the moment, we're blocking our social media sites and then permitting everything else. So once again, notice we can't get to youtube.com, we can't get to Instagram and so forth. So what I need to do here is click plus. We're going to do a geo block. So geo block Africa, let's say, from our inside zone. Destination would be outside zone. Networks would be geolocation. And notice here, I don't actually need to create that object first. I could just block the whole of Africa here. But scrolling down, this is the object that I previously created. So I'll select that and click OK. Uh, we may want to log this. So we'll do logging at the beginning and end of connection. Now, rather than clicking OK and then having to rearrange this like I did previously, 
I'll select the order as one and add that at the top of our access rules. And actually I'll just change this to out so that we know the direction and I'll click okay. Now I've shown you two examples of blocking traffic from the inside to the outside, but perhaps you wanna block traffic from the outside, especially from specific geolocations. So I'm gonna say block and I'm gonna make this block Africa inbound. So in this case, the zone source is gonna be outside. The networks on the outside that we're gonna block in this case is our geolocation object. So Africa, the destination would be inside. Now again, this is just an example. In my case, a really bad idea to block all traffic to Africa because of my team in South Africa. We're going to log this as well at the beginning and end of connection. So again, if I don't select the order, it's gonna put it at the end as it's done over there. So I might wanna move that to the second position and that's got updated now. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is deploy those changes. Notice access rule added, geo block Africa in, access rule added, geo block Africa out. We're going to deploy that and click OK. Again, you just need to wait for the orange dot to disappear, and then I'll be able to test whether I can get to these websites. Okay, so that's successfully deployed now. Let's do a test. So previously I could get to this website. So if I go to that website, notice it actually works. And this is where you have to be careful with geolocation is that that website is probably not hosted directly in South Africa. It's probably using Cloudflare. So let's test that. If I do a NS lookup for that website, notice here is the IP address. And if I do a who is on that IP address. So if I enter in that IP address, notice Cloudflare. So you need to be careful. So my demonstration wasn't a good example of trying to block a specific website because that website is hosted by Cloudflare. So I'm probably not even sending the traffic to South Africa, it's probably somewhere in Europe or the UK, but this will block traffic from Africa to my firewall and block my internal users from sending traffic to Africa. If your customers and suppliers are only in a specific part of the world, it makes sense to block high-risk countries as an example and only allow traffic to and from those parts of the world that you legitimately work with. So I'll do another test with this website, domains.co.za, and notice that traffic is blocked. So I can't get to that website at the moment. If I disable this geolocation, I'll do it for both and deploy that. And now notice because those rules are, have been removed, I can get to domains.co.za, whereas previously that was blocked. So again, I'll quickly create a rule that blocks Africa out. So zone is inside zone, destination is outside zone, networks, I'm just gonna use their geolocation option here. I won't use the object in this case, click okay. Need to move this up because I forgot to do that. So I'll say social media networking first, geolocation, and then permit everything else. And then I'll click deploy that change. Okay, that's now been deployed. So let's try again. I'll go to domains.co.za. As you can see, that's hanging. If I open up a new tab and try and go directly, notice that's hanging because once again, I'm blocking Africa from inside to outside. It didn't work once again with this website News24 because that is not hosted in South Africa, it's hosted on Cloudflare, whereas this website is hosted in Africa, so traffic is being blocked. Okay, so let's do one more. So I'll click plus, let's select applications. So I'll click plus, notice 6,788 applications can be blocked. I'll just select Amazon. Let's say I wanna stop my wife from accessing Amazon. You could, for instance, block Amazon Alexa if you want to stop that or the ad system. So you could narrow this down and only block specific parts of Amazon, but I'm just going to simply block the whole of Amazon and click OK. If I'm going to put my rule, so block Amazon, let's set that to number two. And I almost allowed that. I want to make that a block. So good thing I didn't put a name in and I'll click save to save that. So notice block Amazon is there. Before I deploy that, let's try and go to amazon.com. Notice you can see I'm at amazon.com and it tells me that I'm in the United Kingdom. So I'll go to amazon.co.uk and notice I can see the Grand Tour team on screen here, but let's block Amazon and click okay. Our deployment is now in progress. Okay, that's now deployed. So let's try and go back to Amazon com unfortunately that works and 
as you can see here, I messed up. I forgot to block the direction of traffic. So I need to specify inside zone, destination is outside zone. So I couldn't just specify the application being Amazon. I need to specify which traffic is going to get blocked. So let's see if I can fix that. So source is inside, destination is outside, application is Amazon, and I'll click OK. And hopefully that will now work once I've deployed it. Okay, so that should hopefully work now. I've got inside to outside zone, blocking any traffic going to Amazon. So let's try again. I'll go to amazon.com. Okay, it looks like it's working according to this. But let's do a proper test because that may be cached. So what I'm going to do is open up a incognito window and try and go to Amazon. And notice now we see that that's not working. So be careful with your browser caching when testing this. Notice that's blocked now. So in Google, I'll just try and search for Amazon. Let's say Amazon Spain and try and go to Amazon.es. That doesn't work. That doesn't work in incognito. What about just a standard browser? Notice that doesn't work now either. So again, be careful with your cachings. If I try and refresh .co.uk, it's showing on my browser, but I can't get to Spain. And let's just go to Amazon Germany as an example. Try and choose a different website. So Amazon.de. Notice here we told that we are attempting to access a forbidden website. Contact your system administrator for details. So my wife is probably not going to be too impressed seeing that, but that's how you block a application as an example. Under network overview, we can see transactions, so inside to outside, and we've got geolocation block Africa. We've got transactions, once again, ICMP showing a lot of traffic. And then we can see various categories such as search engines, advertisements, etc. At the moment, we don't have any threats, so that's great. If I look at applications, we can see that most of the traffic being sent is ICMP. And that seems weird to me. I see more ICMP than HTTPS, DNS, Quick, YouTube, etc. But the reason why is I've got this continuous ping running. Okay, so I think that's enough now. I've shown you some basic setup of the Cisco Firepower 1010. We can see the model here. We can see the firmware, etc. I'll show you once again how to update the firmware in a separate video. But hopefully that gives you a good introduction to a Cisco Firepower or Cisco Secure Firewall as it's known these days. Let me know in the comments anything else you want to see. I'm David Bumble and I want to wish you all the very best.